Hi. We've talked about government regulation before, but not really the nuts and bolts. There are a few ways government can regulate. One of them is to pass a regulation. In other words, pass a law. Another one is to provide a tax incentive or a subsidy to the private sector or the local governments for complying with some sort of plan. Um, another one, that, that, would, that would include, by the way, individual tax credits. It would include any kind of incentive, financial or otherwise, to complying with legislation. Um, the national highway system, by the way, you know, you've got another system where the federal government provided an, an incentive to the states to sign on and so on and so forth, from what I remember. The, the last way is just to, for the government to do it itself and you know, to pass the tax or borrow money to build something. Now, all these, all these methods have their pros and cons, their advantages and their disadvantages. And it's, and a lot of politics has been unhelpful simply because it hasn't considered, first of all, the fact that these three methods all relate to some form of government regulation. In other words, the government is trying to get something done and it's got three different ways of doing it, at least. Uh, and it's, you know, it's all, but it all eventually amounts to the same thing in the end, whether the private sector is doing it at the behest of government policy or a government subsidy or whether the government is doing it itself. Now, in a country as large as the United States, there's been a tendency to allocate a lot of projects to local levels, simply because you don't want a federal government of mostly lawyers in Washington, D.C., trying to impose policy all in a vast country, especially when they don't have necessarily the expertise in construction, in, say, housing development, or medicine, and so on and so forth. So if the information that they're going to get is going to be secondhand, why not direct or incentivize you know, lo more local players to get things done? And the downside of that, you know, the downsides and upsides to all these different methods. But what's, what's gotten lost in all the debates is that they are, in the end, tantamount to the same thing. And, you know, they're essentially the government injecting itself into individual lives under the premise that you want to live in a, in a society that has, on some level, regulation. So that you don't end up with a... a a, a Mad Max scenario or a, or a kind of, you know, unplanned situation. And, and when you think about it, almost everything we have is planned. You know, you look at these houses, we're in a suburb, you know, the, the houses are essentially the same for the most part. They're a certain distance from each other. Uh, you're not looking at a wide variety of, of diversity in any suburb. That's not a coincidence. You're, again, looking at government policy. You're looking at that government policy combined with the uh, working with developers to come up with an efficient system that allows the government to gain property taxes while ensuring that property developers, many of whom are tied to the local city councils, are able to make a profit. And of course, you've got the banks involved to get their cut when an, an individual or a business takes out a mortgage. So you can see how this is an extremely, either way, no matter how you get things done, you're still dealing with a lot of complexity in a large country like the United States. So you can see how, in order for the discussion, in order for political cooperation to occur, you have to have a strong journalism sector. You have to have some sort of force that brings together, when passing a law, information that's reliable and also diverse, so that you don't end up in either a bickering match or talking past each other. And, we, and of course, there's been hearings, congressional hearings, but, you know, a lot of those are, you know, you subpoena somebody, that person shows up. Sometimes that person will plead the fifth. A lot of those hearings happen, you know, when a problem has already surfaced and when things have gotten so bad that Congress is stepping in as a kind of a disciplinarian rather than a forward-thinking body of government. And so it's just very important to have this overview. Now, you can see how the first method, passing a regulation, is also not necessarily ideal, simply because you don't want the government, say, imposing so much regulation that it ends up 
creating disincentives for the private sector to build a body of knowledge and then compete with other private sector actors in order to lower prices based on competition. And you know, that's, that's the criticism of the last method, which is that the government is simply doing something, there's no incentive, to, there's no competition. And as a result, you've got, you know, price, prices are not going to be set, or could not be set in a way that's fair, etc. And let's take the example of low-income housing. You've got a situation where a government could say on any level, could say, if you want to build housing, you're going to have to allocate 10% of this housing to low-income residents. So we, in order to prevent ghettos, uh, so you don't want everyone low income in one area of town. We know that causes crime. Uh, it, it allows the mafia to sprout up and build a base. So we want Section 8 housing or low income housing in all over the country and to, to promote not, you know, integration. In other words, a lack of segregation, especially in America, which has had a history of both in fact and by law segregation. But the problem is, of course, when you pass a regulation like that, you're costing somebody money, that developer, is not going to make as much money or the landlord uh, and subsequent landlords are not going to make as much money uh, as they could have otherwise made. So what's so what ends up happening is that's where a subsidy or an incentive comes in. So the government at that point is able to come in and offer a tax credit or offer something that allows, you know, this sort of policy to be implemented in the least way, in, in the least harmful way possible. Uh, so that's where you have tax credits. That's where you have all kinds of different incentives. Um, so it's important to realize that there's what, as, as we like to say, there are more than one way, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I don't know where that expression came in, but if you think about it, it's a, lot, it's a little bit of a very odd expression that PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, I'm sure dislikes. Um, so you go back and forth, you look at all the ways that you can regulate and you know, you can see they all have their upsides and their downsides. And you can also see that this isn't necessarily the case all over the world. In a small country, it should be perfectly acceptable for the central government, aka a national government, aka a federal government, to regulate as much as it wants because it's not distant from what's happening. And so in a country like, it's at, or as distant from what's happening, in a country as small as Singapore, you know, there's no one's going to complain where land is scarce, if the government says you can, you have to build, if you want to build a new house, you have to build, you know, a, a uh, housing structure that can house a minimum of this many people. And there has to be a high rise here in Hong Kong, same situation, limited land, so on and so forth. Now, Singapore also, if you wanted to build a mall, essentially mandates, from what I understand, that a library must be part of that mall. That has to be a tenant within that mall. So you want to build a mall, there has to be a, a library within that mall so that you end up in a situation where anybody can go shopping or have convenient access to books. Great idea, right? Great idea. Um, the landlord or the developer gets consistent income from the government, uh, which runs the library. They, that becomes sort of um, what you call an anchor tenant. And then you have everyone else. You've got a consistent stream of students coming in that supports your food court either on the top floor or the basement that supports a movie theater on the top floor and so on and so forth. So you can, you can see how in some countries, a lot of people would say, well, you know, I don't, I don't really agree with this system. Uh, I, want, I just want to build a shopping mall and I'm going to build a small one and we have plenty of land and I don't want a library over here because I've got a private, private used new bookstore, Barnes and Nobles, Borders, well, I've got a used bookstore a mile away. And if you want a book, you know, you can just go there and why not, you know, people in this area need something else. They either need more space for, you know, clothing stores. Uh, why not allow a small business coming in? Because you've got to, you know, you're taking space away from what could be the next, you know, Nike or the next major brand, all of which at some point starts small. So you can see this idea of freedom, right? It always goes up against other considerations and there's always a winner and a loser and it's so difficult to discuss all these things because there's always speculation well sure most businesses fail you're sure you've got an anchor tenant that it's going to give you consistent revenue uh, but what about the foot traffic how do you know that 
you know, what if some libraries are going to have more foot traffic and others is someone measuring all these things, right? So, you, so the second step is to look at accountability. Uh, are people, you know, checking to see whether the residents in this area, many of whom, you know, may prefer books online, are even using, you know, that access or, 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 the, or that service. So you go back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, to take, you know, I'm trying to think of another, of another example. But again, when you're dealing with a smaller country, when you talk about the mortgage situation, uh, the housing situation, like in Singapore, you know, the government is subsidizing the housing structures. And, you know, if you want to get a mortgage in Singapore the, as a citizen, the rate is extremely low. I mean, I think it's something, it may not even, not even be 3% these days. Um, but of course, because land is scarce, and the government also restricts people, certain groups of people, from being able to apply for these mortgages and being able to have housing of their own um, based on you know, marital status and a lot of other things that, you know, are probably not going to comport with the American idea of a free market or freedom. And one of those ideas, by the way, you know, you've got, we talked about housing, and one of those ideas would be in Singapore, you simply cannot have a housing structure that is publicly funded or publicly approved that doesn't contain a certain minimum percentage of minorities. So in other words, you've got a majority Chinese country and to prevent ghettos and racial enclaves, every new housing structure must have a certain minimum percentage of, of people who speak Tamil or people of Indian descent, uh, people who are Malay and so on and so forth. And you can see again, there are limits to these kinds of impositions as more and more you know, couples um, from different religions and different races uh, intermarry. Suddenly, you know, you've got a problem. You know, you don't, you know, if someone who is Chinese marries someone who's Malay, now you've got, a, you've got an issue because that child would technically be able to mark Malay on his or her housing application in the future. But which one would be fair to mark? Uh, the idea, you know, is how do we judge whether that person is more, uh, has the cultural values or identifies more with one culture than the other or one race than the other? And you start to see how it becomes, it does become an issue of freedom to the extent the government is trying to mandate criteria that determines those kinds of choices for those individuals that don't neatly fit into a box. And we have those same issues in America. Uh, there is no box for someone like me. Uh, I always thought it was, a, it was a joke that I would have to pick the box that says other, uh, simply because, you know, that's the joke, is that if you, if you listen to Eli Weisel, you listen to, you know, history, or you study history, the way that you discriminate against minorities is by making them into the other. And in the U.S., if we don't fit a neat box that's already there for you, uh, that may open up federal subsidies or federal hiring preferences, you have to check, or well, you would check the box other, which historically speaking, if you've studied German history and other kinds of history, uh, is, 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 is probably not the best term that a government should be using. So you go back and forth, back and forth, and you start to realize that there's no perfect system, and the, what we really need are is accountability, that second step. So let's say you make a mistake in a small country like Singapore, you can fix it right away. You've got data that comes back to you that's consistent. If some, you've got an employee that's not doing his or, her, his or her job, there's a much higher chance that you're going to have access to better feedback if you're in a small place. In a place like America, you could have a corrupt police department in Los Angeles You may that has 20 different branches and one wouldn't even know what the other is doing, doing at, any, at, at an exact point in time. So there are benefits to centralization. In a small country, you've got the Singapore police force. Of course, you probably have a, you know, intelligence services, but for the most part, something happens. You've got a recognizable uniform with one logo that everyone knows uh, and everyone will trust because it's not as complex. So you go back and forth. You know, you look at a country like China, a lot of land, but heavy regulation from the central government. Why? A lot of people. So now you have to have, now it's, it's not land that's a problem. Now you have to find, you know, a housing for a billion people in a growing population. And so you're still going to build up. You're still going to use the Hong Kong, Singaporean method. 
and you're still going to try to build a base of knowledge that allows you to regulate in better ways in the future. So if you go to Singapore, you go into an old housing block, they'll call it HTBs. Uh, you know, the old ones don't even have uh, trash compactors. And so if you want to have, um, they've got, or well, if you want to take the trash out, you probably save a plastic bag from your grocery store. You put your trash in there and then you walk it outside like everyone else on the floor and you put it in the trash compactor that goes all the way down to a bin on the ground floor and it's collected once a week. And the newer housing models, I'm sure, will have, will have you know, a, you know, just more modern designs, right? You've got, you know, the sinks will have trash compactors and so on and so forth. So you can see how, first of all, it's just how complex regulation is and how even well-meaning governments will have issues getting it right. So what you, what you really want when, when you're discussing governmental policy is the Singaporean method, which says that we are a practical nation. We're gonna try something, and if it doesn't work, we'll try something else. The benchmark for success will be efficacy. That's, just, that's the LKY way, Lee Kuan Yew Y philosophy. And it's made Singapore the most successful political program or entity in the entire world. And perhaps also in just in modern human history. So, but you have also have to remember that <laughs> this could work against you. Hong Kong for, is a small place, but because of colonization, it's recognized that it's become a financial center and also one that launders money for criminal organizations. So it's not size that, and pop, it's not population. At the end of the day, you're looking at accountability and you're looking at the ability to get things done right, which requires integrity and transparency. And so obviously that's easier in a smaller country, but not necessarily. So you can see that Singapore's secret sauce has really been its integrity, has really been the government's ability to elevate the right people into the right positions and then keep them there in a way that ensured talent would always be a part of, Singaporean, of Singapore's government on both sides, on the minority sector, the minority opposition party, as well as the, um, the majority party, which is the PAP. You put all these things together and the secret sauce isn't really secret after all. You wanna get talent. You wanna have enough talent to compete with the private sector. You wanna have regulations that allow you to build a body of knowledge, of institutional knowledge that you can improve upon particularly with respect to essential items like food, farming, housing, water. These are just sort of basic things, right? And so if something works, you're going to use it. If it works very well, you may even try to export it within that globalized structure. In Singapore's case, you wanna have a niche as well, which is, which is ports, refueling ships, repairing ships that come into your port, which is a vital, a vital port in the whole world for global trade. You also want to have a financial sector that is able to you know, secure payments and have hopefully one of the best security systems in the world for money transfers to facilitate trade going through those ports and security checks going through those ports. So you can see how, yes, it's complex, but it's, the secret sauce is not secret. Talent, transparency, and integrity. In a bigger country, the problem goes into a data feedback loop where you have an incentive for local governments that are receiving these subsidies and incentives to not tell the other governments or oversee or oversight panels what's, what's going on to the extent there's a problem. And you go back and forth and back and forth, but you, the formula is still the same. It's just what I just mentioned. So at the end of the day, when you, when you think about government, you know, you've got regulation, subsidies, and then just the government doing it itself. And whether which method works better than others has to do with a, with a multitude of factors. You know, one of them is, you know, does which, which, who's got the best expertise or the most expertise? Who's got the best track record? Who's, who's got the most transparency? Who's got the most um, integrity? And also, are you going to be in a system that has checks and balances, um, not necessarily in law, but just in terms of actual oversight? So that if something does go wrong or if something isn't working, you're going to have that data going into a body, whether it's, it's private, private or public, that's able to do something about it so that you can reverse course before things get too late and you end up in a congressional hearing 
uh, with just, you know, which becomes a bickering match that gets you nowhere productive.